Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I I hope everybody can uh, hear me. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank, at the beginning, I would like to thank very much the hotel owner and Mr. Abdul and Mr. Ibrahim Suleiman uh, for organizing this lecture. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm really delighted that so many people uh, could come and uh, I would like to war uh, very warmly greet people from ESNA, uh, from the inspectorate and uh, the chief inspector of the area for a big effort they made to come here for this lecture. Well, I would, like today, I would like to give you today introduction to history and archaeology of Gebelein uh, and also present uh, what we are doing there, me and my colleagues. Uh, we are surveying uh, Gebelein for last for about four years uh, and I'm really delighted that I can finally uh, I can deliver the lecture here in uh, Luxor. I think most of us, when we think about ancient Egypt, first thing we uh, comes to our minds mind are big tombs, richly decorated burials, monumental temples, pyramids, everything which is actually connected with capitals, with the most opulent, most extraordinary part of the uh, society of ancient Egyptians. But it is but smaller centers like Gebelein, provincial areas are escaping our attention. And I hope during this lecture I can show you that uh, provincial centers are as well interesting. Mainly because uh, we are used to, the, used to capitals. And now we, could see, we can see something more provincial. Uh, and so let's see what is happening beyond the capital. So Gebelein is located about 28 kilometers southwest from Luxor on the west bank of the Nile. The area, uh, the main feature of the area are two rocky, sorry, uh, two rocky mountains, uh, the eastern and the western one. You can see on the first, uh, on the upper slide, the western mount and far in the background, the eastern mount. Both of them are made of limestone rocks which are separated by small valleys. The eastern rock is just by the Nile and it was enabling control of the navigation on the river in this area. History of research of Jebelein uh, is very long and complicated. Many famous scholars were working there, for example, Gaston Maspero or Henri de Morgan. Unfortunately, most of them did not publish the results of their, their excavations at Gebelein and some of them did not publish at all, so it is difficult to reconstruct the history of the research of the area as well as uh, locate the finding spots of many artifacts which went to numerous uh, museum collections around the world. Because of the lack of the good publications, uh, we need to uh, take a look into unpublished materials which are stored in numerous archives and museums around the world. So in our research, uh, besides doing the field survey, we are also doing uh, archival inquiries. We are analyzing unpublished uh, field journals, analyzing depictions made by numerous artists who went uh, through Jebelein and documented local landscapes. Some of the missions which were working there made numerous images from during the excavations. Uh, therefore, we can uh, locate the excavations areas and compare the changes in the landscape. The images are very useful because the landscape in the area changed dramatically in some places during the last 100 years. When we started our project in 2013, uh, we know where we know very well the location of Gebelein, but we were not sure what is the distribution of archaeological sites in the area. We know that numerous very important artifacts came from Gebelein, but actually it is unknown where exactly they were found. During our research we are trying to locate their finding spots. <coughs> uh, 
When we speak about the area of Gebelein, we need to speak about uh, modern and ancient toponyms. So the name Gebelein means two mountains, because there is the eastern and western mount of Gebelein, and it was already important for uh, it was already uh, important for local community in very early times, as you can see here on Nagadawan, so early pre-dynastic bowl from Gebelein, which shows two mountains of Gebelein. Uh, the ancient Egyptian name of Gebelein was Inerti, and the determinative of this uh, name was, were two rocks over here. Two cities were located at Gebelein in ancient times. Uh, the earliest, at the, the one which is attested as the earliest is Sumenu. It's, uh, here is the name. Uh, it's already attested during times of the first dynasty. During the uh, late Old Kingdom, 6th or 5th dyna dynasty, another name emerged in this area, Perhut Heru, which was also known in later times, in Greek or Roman times, as Pathiris. And now we actually, during our surveys, we are trying to locate uh, the areas, well, the toponyms in the landscape. So now we know that in the northern part of Gebelein was located Sumenu and its necropolis, which we uh, call now the northern necropolis. In the central part of Gebelein was Perhathor and its cemetery, which we now call the central necropolis. And in the very south was the southern necropolis. During this lecture, I would like to take you to a trip from Sumenu to Salvan Necropolis. My, ne my main field of interest is actually pre-dynastic period, uh, so uh, I will focus a little bit more on these times uh, because I found it I'm finding this very interesting. Gebelein is very advantageously located in the, on the crossroad uh, of several tracks. So from Gebelein you can go to Western Desert. Uh, through Wadi, starting at Rizekat about here to the Eastern Desert and take uh, Darb Rayayana Road through Teban Hills, which is a marvelous short, uh, shortcut from, uh, because if you want to go from Rizekat to Hu along the Nile, the travel will take you f about three days, but it is only one day through the desert and mountains here. So this was very strategic location. And also Gebelein, because its location just along the Nile uh, from the uh, eastern mount, the eastern mount enabled one to control the navigation in this area. Also, uh, from Gebelein, if you will go through the desert, you can reach uh, Nubia and Darfur. Uh, so it was also important for communication with, uh, with the south. Gebelein uh, appears in Egyptian history very early, already in the pre-dynastic times. According to Toby Wilkinson, at Gebelein was located capital of pre-dynastic proto-state. And if you will take a look into artifacts dated to pre-dynastic times, you actually can agree with this because such artifacts in the pre-dynastic times are very unique and are very luxurious goods. Thus, uh, the local elite was very rich, and the reason why it, it was so uh, opulent uh, may come from the political significance of this area. Also, the early dynastic times are, are quite well represented. Due to very dry conditions at Gebelein, it was possible uh, that uh, some uh, uh, organic materials survive in very good conditions. So, for example, pre- and early dynastic furniture are perf perfectly preserved till nowadays. And uh, uh, thanks to the analysis of archival materials, publications, and thanks to our survey, it was possible to reconstruct archaeological topography of Gebelein during pre- and early dynastic uh, times. We know that already during pre- and early dynastic times, town of Sumenu was in the north, as well as its cemetery. And we know where some artifacts were discovered at Gebelein. Like, for example, very well-preserved human body, uh, stone knives and stone sculptures were discovered in the, in the area of Perhathor. 
I think all of you know this gentleman, famous Gebelein man. Uh, it was discovered at the very end of 19th century by Wallace Batch. Unfortunately, his description of the finding spot was very poor, uh, but luckily, thanks to small hints in his uh, uh, description of the area, it was possible to indicate that this body was found in the southern part of Gebelein, along with several others uh, very well preserved deceased. And in the northern part, uh, in the northern necropolis, uh, also famous Gebelein Linen was discovered. It contains one of the oldest depictions of a king during some kind of a ritual here in the um, on the right uh, part of, the, of this image. During the Old Kingdom, Gebelein lost its uh, significance, but during the first intermediate, it, the first intermediate period was time of its very its great prosperity. It starts in the end of the Old Kingdom. Some important people were buried at Gebelein. For example, Ini, who was royal treasurer, uh, great overseer of a gnome and uh, overseer of priests in the temple of Sobek in this area. It's interesting that Nomark is uh, buried at Gebelein because, as far as we know, Gebelein was not a cap was not capital of a gnome. It was rather a rural area. Some uh, agricultural estates were located in this area, which is stated by one of the oldest uh, papyri which came, uh, which were found in Egypt. Those were uh, discovered at Gebele in the 1930s by Italian mission, and they describe the, how the local uh, provincial uh, land um, was managed and how a uh, rural estate was functioning during le the late Old Kingdom. It is also very interesting that very opulent findings are dated from Old Kingdom in the area, like such very nice inlaid uh, wooden boxes. Unfortunately, publications uh, of the, the researches where these artifacts were found are rather poor, so it is very difficult to understand their original context. Very Im uh, important tomb was discovered in 1911 in the northern necropolis of Gebelein. It is so-called Tomb of Unknowns. Why? Because uh, in three burial chambers, five deceased were found. Uh, they were resting in a wooden and stone sarcophagi. They had very rich furnishing of the tomb. As you can see here, this uh, wooden box uh, decorated with faience tiles. Some of the mummies are extremely well preserved, and even features of, face, of faces are uh, still very visible, as well as nipples over here. It's quite a unique finding. Uh, unfortunately, although some inscriptions survived in this tomb, uh, none, no name of any of the owners of the sarcophagi survived, thus the name Tomb of the Unknowns. Very close to the Tomb of Unknowns at the northern necrop necropolis was located Tomb of E.T. E.T. was army commander, and he was buried with his wife, Neferu, who was priestess of Hathor, Lady of Dendera. This is one of the most important tombs of the first intermediate period due to its very elaborate uh, decoration, showing everyday life uh, in this area, like, for example, filling granaries with grain here. And on the right, you can see the owners of the tomb, Eti and Neferu. It was a very monumental tomb. It consisted of a large courtyard in the front. Then there was a row of pillars, that's the name Seth Tomb. And behind the pillar there was a small corridor and rooms made of mud bricks. And they were uh, richly decorated with uh, depictions, as, which you can see here. In the middle there was a burial chamber at the chapel. Uh, dedicated to E.T. And in the northern part, so on your right, was burial of his wife. In the publications concerning the tomb, uh, it's actually not mentioned whether or not what was the surrounding of the tomb. The tomb is usually treated separately without its context. 
Uh, during our survey, uh, we observed that there are numerous other tombs in this area, some of them quite monumental, like A, the arrow with letter A is indicating large uh, rocks, uh, rock cut tomb, and C is a mastaba dis discovered uh, by Mr. Abdel Hadi Mahmoud and uh, Yahya Al Masri. Yes, uh, it was discovered in the 1990s. It's also a very interesting mastaba because uh, it contained more burials than uh, it can be expected. Uh, in the southern part of uh, this cemetery, so here where this house is standing, and here there were even more tombs. Unfortunately, due to expansion of local settlement, uh, they are not visible now, but we took a look into archival images uh, from archives in Turin, which uh, shows uh, the tombs during the excavations, and we could compare the landscape back then and now. And we can see that uh, the arrow here is indicating the location of tomb of E.T., and, uh, and the tomb which is, which is excavated here, it's, it's located somewhere in this area, and the one on your right, it's just south from the tomb of E.T. It was possible to locate the tombs thanks to uh, landscape features, otherwise they would have gone unnoticed because they are now covered by contemporary settlements. In the area we also found funerary cones, which are typical for 11th dynasty, so this uh, provides us with dating and confirms uh, the interpretation of the tombs as uh, south tombs. Such, uh, such concentration of monumental south tombs, it's uh, something unusual for a rather provincial center, so this actually points at the question, what was the uh, status of Gebelein, where was there like important administrative center or not? We will talk about this in a moment. The, this is the central part of the central necropolis of Gebelein. Something very interesting is happening here. In the center of the image, of here, there is a tomb, another self tomb, excavated by and discovered by Italian mission in 1990s. They excavated the north northwestern corner of this tomb. What is interesting, oh, maybe I'll show you a plan of this tomb. It was only a small fragment of it was excavated, but we conducted a geophysical prospection in the area, and it was and we observed that we have here very strong anomalies, which are reflections of the walls of the tombs. Uh, which were made, uh, the tombs were made of mud bricks, so they are clearly visible in the, on the background of sand and rocks. And it was possible to reconstruct, uh, based on this uh, geometric map, to reconstruct the layouts and plans of the tombs, and we confirmed that south from the, this tomb was yet another one, and some other structures were in the north. What is interesting about this tomb is that it is located at the foot of this triangle-shaped hill, hill over here, and it's exactly on the axis of this uh, natural structure. And uh, when you look at this uh, rock from east or northeast, it has this shape of a natural pyramid. Can you see that? Yes, it makes this... Yes, yes. And in the north, a little bit to the north, so on your right, there is yet another similar rock with this suspicious shape. And also over there, in the very center, was another tomb located exactly in the, on the axis of this um, small uh, rock. So I think uh, this place was chosen deliberately by the owner of the tomb to enhance and to uh, stress and maybe uh, upgrade the status of the tomb because it gives you an idea that makes this tomb more monumental. It connects the tomb with the landscape and this pyramid, natural pyramid, is evoking uh, royal pyramids in uh, cemeteries where uh, pharaohs of the old kingdom were buried. Of course, the 
uh, laymen, people not related with uh, royal family, couldn't uh, be buried in pyramids, but they maybe wanted here to uh, accent their very high social sta status. Of course, this cemetery is full of other tombs. Most of them, more than 100, uh, are uh, simple shafts uh, cut into the limestone of the western uh, mount. During our surveys, we counted, I think, more than 100 of such tombs in this uh, area. This, uh, this plan is showing only the northern part of the central necropolis, and each point is the location of a tomb. Most of them are simple shafts, but some of them, like here on the uh, right, bottom right corner, are tombs uh, cut into the rocks, into the rock, and some of them has pr preserved traces of painted decorations. In some cases of the rock of the shafts, uh, in the upper part of the shafts are still preserved mud brick superstructures. And now let's go to the southern necropolis of Gebelein. The place was visited already by William Petrie in, uh, July, in, in, uh, in January of 1887. And he went to the top of the eastern mount and now he's looking in the direction of a cemetery. Can you see the cemetery? Of course not. It's located exactly here. Uh, during Petri times, it might have been, although it was at the time of low water in the Nile, it might have been covered by the uh, silt and water of the Nile. He went further down and the cemetery, unfortunately the image is very badly preserved, but the cemetery is just somewhere about here and uh, I uh, took a look into his diary and found the date when he visited Gebelein. He never mentioned uh, this cemetery in his uh, document, so I presume it was not visible in the 19th century. And it was not mentioned by any other mission working at Gebelein. And we, when we went there, we found that there is more than 11 sometimes very well preserved tombs. Some of them collapsed already. Here you can see only outline of a burial chamber over here. Others are more lucky and you can clearly see the shape of the courtyard. You go to the, through the entrance and then there is a big pillar in the center and you can see a shaft here and entrance to another uh, chamber over there. This is the biggest tomb at the cemetery. For a provincial center, it's really huge. I made a very preliminary drawings showing just shapes and sizes of three tombs, which are typical for this cemetery. So the biggest one has a courtyard 13, meter, uh, 13 meters wide, and then there are two chambers. Maybe more because this corridor here is collapsed. Uh, and there are also other smaller tombs like the one on the top or here. This one is quite interesting because you have a courtyard, first chamber with two pillars, and then descending corridor which goes, which terminates with a burial chambers, uh, chamber on the west part. And because there, there is no, because the uh, quality of limestone here is very poor, there is no decoration that survived till now, uh, nowadays, so it is very difficult to date the tombs. Uh, therefore, the only way to uh, give the approximate dating of the tombs is by analyzing of the architecture. So here you can see the entrance to the uh, descending corridor which uh, ends with burial chamber in the tomb uh, which you can see here. And something similar we can see, uh, sorry, something similar you can see uh, in Aswan. This is tomb of... Uh, Sorry, I uh, just forgot the name. It happens sometimes. Yes, it's Herhuf. Yes, tomb of Herhuf, which is time of uh, Sixth Dynasty. And so you can see similar uh, architectural uh, design. So chamber with pillars and descending corridor. So I think this uh, cemetery, and of course I, comp I compared the shapes of the tombs in the southern necropolis of Gebelein, with tombs uh, at Moala, and they are quite similar. In general, the shapes are 
basically the same, just uh, the tombs at Gebelin are slightly bigger. And uh, because the cemetery at Moala is dated to late Old Kingdom and uh, the first intermediate period, I think the Salvan Cemetery at Gebelin should be of the same date. What is another thing interesting about the cemetery, it's located very low uh, in the valley. This means people in, during the late Old Kingdom uh, and the first intermediate period was, were not afraid that the water can enter the tomb even during uh, the inundation period. Therefore, uh, they were quite comfortable with the idea to locate the tombs there. And this, also, this can support the idea that during the late Old Kingdom and the first intermediate period, it was a time of low, lower inundations. So this confirmed the theory according to which uh, the first intermediate period was partly caused by uh, climate changes. Of course, the first intermediate period was time of great prosperity to this region. So the local material culture was flourishing and it has its distinctive um, features. So, for example, in, in production of sarcophagi, there are scenes which are unique for Gebelin region, like um, banquet, 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 banqueting scenes uh, and uh, the deceased uh, on a brier. Very characteristic are stilly from Gebelin from the first intermediate period. They look rather provincial, they're very crudely uh, made. Uh, it's not uh, in any way, does, do not resemble the high quality of stilly from uh, Memphis region. Uh, they're very simple. I know about 29 examples of such stilly from Gebelin region. Most of them depicts, uh, are depicting Nubian mercenaries who are located uh, north from Gebelin. Uh, also, the models of boats and kitchens are uh, featuring very unique uh, features uh, for this region. And wall paintings in tombs dated to the first intermediate period. Uh, unfortunately, in the background here is too, uh, too bright, but uh, there's a comparison of two tombs. In the, on the uh, upper part, you can see a scene with a donkey from the tomb of Anhtifi from Moala. And here, practically exactly looking like the same uh, scene from tomb of Iti at Gebelein. So uh, this suggests that uh, the artists in the region are, were either copying from the tombs in the region or maybe they have like um, something like a catalog of designs, something uh, like there was a repository of depictions they can use in a tombs. But the most unique uh, feature of at that time of this region are the natural pyramids. It's not only Gebelein, uh, at Moala, probably you visited Moala, there is, at Moala there is tomb of Anhtifi. Anhtifi was a nomarch who was ruling at the second and the third uh, upper Egyptian gnomes. He was in alliance with the first gnome of Elephantini and he was trying to expand his uh, domain in the northern direction. He was fighting wars with uh, Theban and Coptic gnomes. He was really powerful, very powerful person in upper Egypt. His tomb is located in this standalone hill, uh, the necropolis of Moala. When you look at this hill from south and from the west, it has a very curious shape. And when you look, uh, if you come even closer, it has this like shape of a pyramid. Uh, probably Anhtifi already recognized this shape as a pyramid because uh, he ordered construction of a valley temple in front of his tomb. The valley temple was connected by a processional uh, path or some kind of uh, uh, rampa with his tomb and uh, in front of the tomb uh, flanking the processional, processional way were two obelisks made of uh, mud bricks. So he was trying to emulate royal uh, architecture of uh, cemetery, uh, royal burials at 
Memphite necropolis to enhance his social position, to enhance his tomb. Because he was not of the royal origin, he couldn't build a pyramid, but he made this very clever way to suggest his uh, social standing, his outstanding position in the uh, southern Egypt during the first intermediate period. And something similar we can see in the central necropolis of Gebelein, because here we also see the tombs located on the axes of a uh, hill of a rocks, which has this shape of a pyramid. I mentioned before that there is a group of uh, stili from the first intermediate period, which are depicting uh, Nubian mercenaries. Of course, Many uh, uh, publications were devoted to uh, this stele, but what is interesting and was actually this esca escapes uh, very often uh, from our attention, that the stele presents not only Nubians, but their families, and they show how the Nubians were uh, living with Egyptians. It shows the social entanglement of the Nubians. They did not come alone as the mercenaries. They came with their families, with their wives and children. So here on the upper uh, left corner, you can see two persons uh, on the left. The owner, uh, the gentleman here, uh, is shown as typical Nubian with a sash, uh, dark uh, complexion, and there on the left there is his wife. You may think she is Egyptian. Well, the inscription uh, says both are Nubians. And on the right, you can see their children, a uh, daughter and a son. And the daughter, it looks like a mix of uh, Egyptian and Nubian influence. Her uh, complexion is a bit, a bit darker than of, his mod of her, uh, her mother. And uh, she has this kind of uh, uh, hair with it's showing that she has like um, it's very uh, typical for Nub Nubians, uh, coffee On the lower uh, right, uh, Stila, you can see uh, another case of uh, social entanglement of Nubians and Egyptians. Uh, here's the owner of the, of the Stila and his wife. Both are uh, described as a Nubians. And the inscription says that here are brothers of this gentleman, four brothers. Three of them have... Uh, Nubian names, and the fourth brother has Egyptian name. Other stili from this region are showing mixed ma marriages. Uh, so the woman is usually dressed in typical Egyptian dress. Uh, her husband is like, shown as typical uh, Nubian, having, wearing typical Nubian dress. Uh, but his wife has uh, very often Egyptian name. And the Nubian sometimes has an uh, Egyptian name, so it shows that both, so uh, both uh, social groups, uh, that is, Nubians and Egyptians, were mixing together and they were uh, forming kind of a mixed uh, culture uh, um, based on a Nubian and Egyptian influence in this region. If we will look into the so uh, a spatial distribution of the stili, they were found only at two sites at Gebelein region. In the north, at Ererizekat, and below at Gebelein, at the northern necropolis. I didn't find any mentioning of, of the discovery of the stili in other uh, location in the Gebelein region. And this suggests that the uh, garrison of Nubian mercenaries could have been located somewhere between those two sites. So it was po possibly Yumiteru or Sumenu. And this was a very good place to locate uh, at the garrison, because if you will look in the map, if you will locate garrison here, you can easily uh, go and control the uh, roads through the uh, Jebel here, the desert, uh, and it was very important uh, for Anhtifi, who was uh, uh, fighting with Theban and Coptic gnomes. Uh, residence of Anhtifi was located here in Hefat, so he was always close to his northern border uh, to fight. And it, it is possible that he was the person responsible for establishing this Nubian-Egyptian garrison north from Gebelein 
to use it in wars with Thebes and Coptic gnomes. So, uh, it also suggests that the southern necropolis uh, at the Gebelein could have been connected and uh, used by people from Hefat. And therefore, the northern necropolis was related with towns of Sumenu and Umiteru. Uh, and people from Umiteru could have been also buried at Erizekat. The first intermediate period is over. Now we are going to the, uh, the Middle Kingdom. And at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom, a uh, temple was a chapel or a uh, temple was founded at Gebelein by Mentuhotep Nebhepetre, who dedicated the uh, chapel at Gebelein to Hathor, Lady of Dendera. What is quite interesting, because he didn't uh, dedicate it to Lady of Gebelein, he preferred for some reason Lady of Dendera. And here you can see uh, some blocks from the temple, which are now in the Turin Museum. During the uh, Middle Kingdom, the temple was still in use uh, in times of Senusret I. So there is unpublished uh, Naos in the British Museum showing Horus uh, Bagdeti. Uh, so there was also a cult of Horus Bagdeti in the temple already in the Middle Kingdom. We have some other findings from uh, times of Senusret I in this region, so he was active here. This is a mother of pearl with name of Sanusaret the first. Now in the British, uh, in the Metropolitan Museum uh, of Art in New York. And uh, during our field survey, uh, we've been uh, researching the area of the temple uh, during past two seasons. And uh, David Vitorek, who is present with us, uh, found numerous uh, inscription on a rock shelf which is just below the area where the temple of Hathor Lady of Dendera could have been erected and where the temple of Hathor Lady of uh, Gebelein was standing uh, as well. This is actually, this is a very difficult place to work. We needed to install whole equipment not to fall down <laughs> and it was very brave of the David to actually uh, take a look at the inscriptions. Of course, it was impossible to use a tracing paper or uh, transparent plastic foils to document the inscriptions. So we've been using uh, photogrammetry, scanning, uh, RTI to document the inscriptions. And David found five panels containing in total 28 inscriptions, uh, which are dated to the late uh, Middle Kingdom and uh, the first intermediate period. And here's one example of such inscription. They, are, they, were made, they were probably made by local priests from the temple, and they are mentioning the priests and their uh, functions, their titles. So this, has, this gives us a glance into the life of the temple during the late Middle Kingdom and the first intermediate period. When we speak about yeah, sorry, second intermediate period. And uh, <clears throat> when you speak about the second intermediate period, we need to mention that also Hyksos kings were very possibly active in this region. We have two blocks of, with names of Hyksos kings. Uh, well, there is, uh, it is kind of a uh, subject of some controversy whether or not Hyksos were present in Upper Egypt and whether or not they were controlling Upper Egypt during the second intermediate period. The evidence uh, from Gebelein suggests that they were active there because we, we have not only the two blocks with name of two different kings, but uh, in Avaris was found a uh, statue uh, dedicated to Sobek, Lord of Sumenu, so northern part of Gebelein. In the British Museum there is a knife uh, with golden handle, which uh, was donated uh, by uh, Apothis uh, to uh, Sobek, Lord of Sumenu. So we have actually quite strong evidence to suggest that uh, Hyksos kings were active in Gebelein region. There is a rock cut below this uh, temple. Now we go to the, mid, uh, now we go to the early uh, New Kingdom. Uh, we knew uh, from publications that there was a chapel mentioned in the area, 
but unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, it was never actually published. There is this uh, New Kingdom uh, spell, so Rock Cut Chapel, in the western, uh, eastern uh, part of the Eastern Rock. The entrance to the structure is located about three or four meters above the ground level, and the structure cons consists of two rooms, the broad vestibule and uh, another uh, western chamber. As you can not see, the decoration, uh, there is a decoration here, but it is very poorly preserved. This is the southern wall of the western room of uh, Rocca Chapel. There is a niche here with a stand, very uh, badly preserved wall, and there are some rel uh, reliefs, some uh, carved decoration here showing Hathor, Lady of Gebelain. Because of the poor uh, condition of the, of the walls uh, in the sanctuary, we use different techniques to uh, trace the location of the depictions. Unfortunately, uh, the quality of the projector do not allow us to see details, so you need to believe me uh, that there are inscriptions here. This is actually a photogrammetric model here, but the colors are showing uh, like on the map, if something is very low, it's shown uh, as blue. If something is, uh, on, is very high, it's red. So thanks to this, we can try to trace small changes in deepness of the walls. So here you can see a pair of legs. One is here and second pair is here. It is actually very difficult to trace these legs when we've been researching the uh, sanctuary two years ago, but this technique allows us to actually see what is uh, very difficult to trace using your eye only during the field research. By comparing different uh, kinds of documentation, it was possible, uh, unfortunately it's so the, well, it's, the projector is too bright, uh, so you cannot see it, it properly. But there is a depiction of Hathor. Hathor with, and above her there is an inscription saying it's Hathor, Lady of Gebelain. And there is a place after a royal cartouche over here. But it's empty. And by careful examination by Daniel Tokac of the Royal Decoration of this temple, uh, it is now quite certain that this uh, rock cut chapel was commissioned by Queen Hatshepsut, whose name was later uh, erased in the temple. Also, it was dedicated to. Uh, oh, yeah, now, now you can maybe see. Yeah? Okay, great. So, also there are depictions of Amun in this uh, rock cut chapel, which were also badly affected during uh, Amarna period. And here you can see the uh, results of our works there, how we docu uh, trying to precisely document uh, the shape of this sanctuary. Of course, our epigraphist uh, is doing a lot of work for us. So, David, uh, during our first season of the Gebelain, discovered previously unknown uh, inscription by Ramses IV. The inscription, you can actually see it here more clearly. Or maybe actually, hmm? Hmm? No? no? Blue background is also not, go not good for this. Okay, anyway, you can see here on the computer, uh, you can see here, uh, this inscription is uh, stating that during the first year of uh, reign of Ramses IV, there was an uh, expedition and according, uh, well, this, actually, this is commemorating previously unknown expedition, possibly to acquire a stone for royal constructions. Uh, thanks to, uh, well, we were, I'm uh, always curious about what is in different archives around the world, and I'm frequently asking and sending emails to many institutions, do they have anything related with Gebelain? When I was in a Chicago house, I was very positively surprised. They have uh, previously unpublished images of uh, stone blocks, which are said to come from Gebelain. They were documented in situ in 1969 by Helen and Jean Jacquet uh, when they were researching uh, Coptic uh, 
antiquities in the area, and also they uh, came across this. They likely took images. Unfortunately, uh, the blocks are lost now, uh, but luckily it's possible to read the inscription and reconstruct at least some parts of history of the local temple of Hathor at Gebelein. So we'll be working on this material uh, during uh, next seasons. After New Kingdom, we're actually missing uh, a lot uh, because there is not too much evidence what was about what was happening after uh, New Kingdom at Gebelein. We have five or six uh, actually artifacts dated to late uh, second intermediate, well, uh, dated to late period. One of the most interesting uh, uh, our objects from Gebelein from the late period is this papyri uh, with chapters of uh, 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 the Book of the Dead. As you can see, it looks rather provincial. It's not as elegant as uh, the Theban papyri, but still it's like a very interesting evidence what was happening in the provincial center that they were active. And then we come to uh, the very end of ancient Egyptian history, the Greco-Roman times. And in early Ptolemaic times, Gebelein uh, had its another time of great prosperity. Nome capital was located at Perhator. In Greek times, Perhator was known as Pathiris. Hundreds of papyri were discovered at Pathiris. Unfortunately, practically all of them were discovered by during illegal excavations. So they are missing a context. Now there are uh, many, they, they are providing us with very rich documentation of provincial city located south of Thebes. Uh, Pathiris was a nome capital of the nome Pathirite till 88 uh, BC. Uh, due to richness of this evidence, it was possible to try to reconstruct the structure of land owning in this region. So here you can see two hills of Gebelein. Uh, the eastern here with the town of Hathor, uh, with the town of Pathiris, and the western hill, there is a Nile, Nile over here, and many scholars were trying to reconstruct the land tenure structure in this area. Uh, thanks to our research, we are gathering more data about the landscape, so we are trying to uh, correct uh, earlier uh, supposition about how the city was uh, functioning in its rural context. Of course, we are very young mission and we are just beginning our research. Uh, this is a very difficult area. Uh, unfortunately, you need to look at the screen here because uh, it's too bright over here. Uh, hmm. Okay, so here is the eastern mount of Gebelein, here is the western, and the letters are showing the locations of uh, archaeological sites we found during our field works. And we only did research in the most threatened areas at Gebelein, so in the north, in the center, and here, but we still need to survey more than ha about half of this area, so central part of the western here, hill and the central part of uh, the eastern hill. This is our uh, goal for future. Well, uh, because we are a uh, young mission and we are uh, doing our, our best, but we are doing this with help of many institutions and many people. Uh, many people uh, are joining our project and I would like to uh, very warmly thank them for their they will help during the field work and help uh, and the help during study of the material. And of course, I would like to thank men, uh, thank to many uh, institutions which financially and uh, in other ways supported our project in past years. And of course, since I'm uh, in Luxor, I would like to uh, thank in particular several people and uh, institutions who are helping us here is, of course, Ministry of Antiquities for uh, allowing us to conduct the works, uh, Polish mission at the Hatshepsut Temple, and uh, director of the project, uh, Dr. Zbigniew Szaprański, uh, Chicago House for uh, letting us, the, uh, well, enabling us to use the library and archives, and of course, inspectors, uh, and the chief inspector of uh, the Esna uh, and Armand 
uh, area, so Mr. Abdel Hadi uh, Mahmoud. And of course, at the end, uh, the person who also helped us during our field uh, organization of field works, and thanks to whom I can present this lecture here, Mr. Uh, Ibrahim Suleiman. And of course, I would like to warmly thank you for coming and your attention during this lecture. Thank you very much. I will be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.